All right, the book of Second John. If we can find First John, we can probably find Second John. Uh, I believe it's what thirteen verses total. Very good. Just a short little note that our Apostle John wrote to somebody, some church. We're not not real sure about it. It shows us, though, that the Holy Spirit thought important enough. Uh, little short notes were part of Scripture, as well as some of the big, long letters that Paul wrote, and even John wrote earlier in 1 John. They're all important because they show the mind of God and how we learn from that. We'll read some of this in just a moment. <clears throat> Let's remember two things in, in our setting this morning. <coughs> remember, John is the apostle, the one that Jesus was very close to as he describes himself, himself the one who Jesus loved. And let's remember also now that John's an old man. He describes himself here as the elder. And that could either mean an older man or a, a title of a, a church office. And he's very concerned about the false teachings that were coming around at that time that had come from former church members, but are now saying that Jesus really didn't come in the flesh. Jesus did not come incarnate, as that word is, in the flesh, in the body, as a real human being. So that's going to be his concern. And number three, let's remember also that at this day and time, when people traveled, you know, they didn't have the kinds of hotels, motels, and the places to stay the night like we have. When we read the story of Jesus, you know, being born in Bethlehem, there's no room in the inn. Uh, uh, inns were very, very rare, and they, and they didn't have a very good reputation. And so a lot of times when people traveled, they stayed with other people along the route, other families. And the way it worked is, is sort of like we used to have some years ago is sometimes people had a little <coughs> extra room or a, what we call a garage apartment or something like that. They would sort of, you know, rent that out night to night as, as, <coughs> as they needed to. And even though this was not a commercial inn, so to speak, with, you know, a uh, swimming pool and three floors and all that, an inn could also mean sort of just an extra room that you have in your house. And so John here is very concerned about the false teachers spreading this bad message. And so he's going to have to say, don't rent your room to them. <clears throat> don't show them hospitality because that only enhances their ability <coughs> to spread falsehood. That's a little different for us, but we'll explain that in just a moment. So that's that's our thought as we get, get the setting here uh, about our situation. All right, we'll read the first three verses of 2 John. <clears throat> the elder, to the lady chosen by God, to her children, whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but also all who know the truth. Because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. John begins his greeting, of course, by offering the wishes of goodness, uh, uh, good morning or uh, good day, hope everything is well, he would say. But he says, grace and mercy and peace from God 
which is asking God's blessings upon the receivers of this letter. And also not only God the Father, but Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, who will always be with us in truth and love. And then he, 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 he writes a little um, um, unclear here. He addresses this to a lady, he says, chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth. And this could be a person, it could be a lady, but actually, probably, that was his way of saying a church, and then the children being the members of the church. You see, if you remember, John, in, a, in his previous letter, talked about little children. He would say, now little children, do this, or dear children, do that. My little children, I want you to know this. Here's an old, elderly father talking to younger. And he uses the affectionate term of little children. And it could be that when he writes this second letter to whoever it is, he also uses this idea of a family. Here's a mother and her children. It could be a church and the members. Doesn't matter, whatever, but probably the latter is the case. And now he says the word truth. Did, did you notice, uh, let's see, he uses the word in truth five times here. Uh, the lady and her children whom I love in the truth and, and uh, all those who know the truth and because of the truth and all this. He uses that word five times here. What does he mean by this? Well, uh, of, of course, the word truth has to do with something that's, that's true. And, uh, and it's always associated with the word or the idea of reality. What is real? What is true? What is accurate? What is correct? as opposed to a falsehood or a fantasy or some kind of a, a wispy uh, a apparition or, or, or vision or something like this. John is poking his finger at those who said Jesus really didn't come as a man. He was just sort of here in a, in, a, in, a, in a spirit world, uh, we just thought he was a man, but he really wasn't. John is poking his finger at that and says, No, we know him in the truth. God's truth is with us. And so truth is a, a true, the true things about Jesus, the true facts about Jesus, a body of facts about Jesus. That is the truth. Now, sometimes in church lingo, we use the word the truth as sort of just a, just a body of facts. Do you believe the truth? Yes, I can check it off. Do you believe that Jesus came to earth? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus is coming again? Yes. So I check all the right boxes, and I got the truth down, and, and I, I agree with all that. That's our confession of faith, and yes, blah, 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 one, two, three, four, five. And that's okay, that's good and proper to do that. But even more so, John is saying truth is, 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 is so much more. You see, earlier... In the first part of John's first letter, he says, we saw Jesus. We looked at him. We touched him. We touched him with our own hands. Our eyes saw Jesus, who was the eternal life that was with the Father and came to this earth. Now that means a whole lot more than just saying, you check the box that says you believe Jesus came to earth. 
yeah, I can check that box. And John would say, that's right. But he also would say, we saw him. We lived with him. We touched him. We heard him. We ate with him. We slept with him. We walked with him. We worked with him. That's the body of facts that John says is the truth. So when we use our, our church lingo sometime about, you know, boy, he's a, he's a strong defender of the truth or he's a preacher of the truth. And, and that's, we need to be careful that it's not just a body of facts, but it's the living Word of God, which is Jesus, that we're wrapping up in this word, the truth. And that is reality. That's not false. That is not a wispy vision. That is accuracy. You remember Jesus on this earth <clears throat> said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, uh, those are some of the I am statements that Jesus made on the earth. I am the truth. Well, first he says, I am the way. Okay? Jesus says, I am the way. You remember in English class? Am, he thought it was an equal mark, okay? Jesus is the way. He's not going to show us the way. He is the way. He's not going to tell us about the way or how to find the way. He says, I am the way. Then he says, I am the truth. And he doesn't say, I'll show you the truth or tell you about it or tell you how to find it or figure it out. He says, I am the truth. It's the second I am statement. Third one is, I am the life. I'm not going to show you the life, or tell you how to find it, or figure it out. But it's me. I'll take you there. I am the life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that is a resounding statement that we need to always remember. There is no other way to the Father except through Jesus Christ, His Son. That's truth. That's reality. That's, that's realness. That's not a falsehood. Later on, uh, John says, uh, uh, writing in his Gospel, that Jesus is asking us uh, to worship in spirit and in truth. Again, in reality, we worship not necessarily an idol that's dead and we don't worship in some way not re realizing that Jesus is some off this off the uh, in another world planet that we cannot quite approach and he's so above us that we can't approach him but he says we worship in truth in reality that he's really here and he's with us and for me, as we gather in worship, the high point is our communion, our holy communion that we have. When we in our hearts contemplate the death of Christ for us, and that's real, that is reality, that is the truth. And I think it's so important that as we partake, we examine ourselves as we read to do so that we take it in a worthy manner. And yes, we are, we are not worthy, only by the grace of God are we worthy. Don't worry about that. He asks us to just take it in a worthy manner, recognizing this truth, this reality of what Jesus is. All right, let me pause there. Any comment or question here? Yes, sir, Dr. May. You know, 
it is unequivocal that the writer of the gospel and writer of this book are the same guy. Yes. He keeps telling us that he was there. He heard Jesus say, I am the truth. So yeah. If you go back to the gospel and count the number of times he used the word truth in that book, it is, it's hard to count. Yes. And he keeps repeating them because he heard Jesus say that. And I think it's sort of cute. You know, another way to tie scripture together, when uh, Moses said, uh, uh, was mattering with God and says, well, who would I tell the sinner? What did he say? Tell him, I am yes. sent you. And Jesus repeated <coughs> over and over, I am, I, I am, am, I am. Yes. Excellent point, I am. In the Garden of Gethsemane, before Jesus' <coughs> arrest and crucifixion, remember the, the mob came to capture Jesus. And remember they came with their clubs and their torches and everything. And Jesus says, who are you looking for? You know what Jesus says? I am. You know what scripture says? This is from the book of John. They fell back in all because he used the words, I am. Now, if I was out on a posse to go capture somebody and I had the reaction that this, this man could be God so much that we fell down on our knees. I don't know if I could continue, continue the, the the rest. Could you? I'd have to think about that. But that's how. That's the moral authority that Jesus Christ had on this earth. And that was truth. Yes, sir. One more point. It's interesting. If those of us who are teachers, what is I am? That's present tense. Yes. God is not yesterday or tomorrow. Yes. He's present. That's I right. Am. That's right. It's not I was or I will be, but I am right now. It's right now. That's a good point. Now see, uh, Kathy here used to be an English teacher. Uh, she's not here today. Uh, uh, she could get some credit today for being an English teacher because we're we're, we're learning that learning the, all the stuff that our dear English teachers taught us in class. And that's good. All right. We'll continue to read verse four through six. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have from the beginning. And I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to His commands. As you have heard from the beginning, His command is that you walk in love. John writes that he's very happy to find these people, probably the church members. Uh, he calls them children, but they're walking in the truth. They're obeying God. They're doing what God wants them to do. Just as God asked us to do, he says. Just as God has commanded us. And he says, I'm not asking you to do anything that's new. It's not a new command. but One we've heard over and over and over from the beginning love one another and the way we know that is because we follow what God asks us to do we follow his commands love delights to obey right when we think about commands and we think about love a lot of times they're at odds with each other we think, yeah, commands are this, 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 and this, and you do that, 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 and that, and you better do it. 
And on the other side over here, we say, oh, I'm just full of love and I'll just sort of do whatever. I just feel so wonderful. And it's hard to mesh those. John does. He says, you do what you do out of love. You end up doing the same thing, but for the right motivation. It's the motivation. Love delights to follow God. Love delights to obey. Love implores us, encourages us to do right. To do right. Okay? And that's what John is trying to tell us. And I think it's it's a very, very good thought we need to have. There is no contradiction at all from doing what God wants us to do and loving Him with all our heart. In fact, it's the same ball of, ball of wax as John would say. God calls us to holy living. And this is what He asks us to do. Alright. Uh, actually, in, in uh, uh, His previous letter, this is love for God that we keep His commands. And His commands are not burdensome. That was a quote from his previous letter, and we know that. All right, any thought on that? We follow God. Yes. Let's continue now, verse 7, 7 through 11. Now, he says, I say this because many deceivers do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be fully rewarded Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. John is pretty serious here. He's pretty hard. He doesn't back off of his words. He says, now, I just said what I said because of the deceivers that have come out to teach false doctrine. What did he just say about following God and following His commands, loving God? And he says, I say that because of the deceivers who had previously been with them and now gone out that do not acknowledge, do not confess as an article of faith that Jesus Christ came in the flesh in this world. And as we've said before, that cuts the heart out of the gospel. No deal, no compromise, no discussion. It's wrong. It's, it's a deal breaker if Jesus did not come as a real person. Any such person, John says, is a deceiver. He's also what he would term an anti Christ person. Now, I can be deceived myself, but if I try to get you to go with me, I'm a deceiver, right? And that's the difference. I can be mixed up about a whole lot of things, and I can be mixed up about this and that in my mind, and probably not do too much damage. But if I go out and try to convince you to go along with all my mixed up ideas, that's a different story. 
that's a, that means I'm actively trying to recruit you to follow me and my deceptions. And John says, then I'm a deceiver. And also, we would say, an anti-Christ. Someone who is against Christ. One who is opposite Christ. These deceivers are opposite everything Christ stands for. Anti everything Christ stands for. Anti every bit of this truth that we talked about earlier. These are the people. And John does not mince his words to say they are anti-Christ. Okay. Now, the effect of this is, as I say, it cuts the heart destroys the gospel. It cuts the heart out of the gospel. Watch out, he says in verse 8 then, that you do not lose what we worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. And this, this might bother us to say, yeah, but salvation is not just a reward for what we work for and we do and do and do and do real hard on earth and because God's going to reward us. No, we know that that is not the case. Our salvation is the gift of God. But you know what? The idea of God rewarding us is an idea that's in the New Testament writer. And they didn't, the New Testament writers didn't, didn't back off this idea that God gives us good things and we can call it a reward. Now, is that the reason? We work and work and do and do and follow God's commands just to be rewarded? No. We work and do and follow His commands because sovereign God is our God and we serve Him. We love Him. And whatever God restores to us and rewards to us in the end is wonderful. But that's not my motivation. You know, it's just like in life. Uh, we work many, many years for a company and and uh, we retire after 40 years and they give us a gold watch. And you say, wow, thank you very, very much. That's a great reward. Did I work 40 years just to get that gold watch? No. I did my job, came in early, and worked late every day, whatever, whatever I had to do to do my job because it was the right thing to do. And if you want to pat me on the back at the end of 40 years with a gold watch, that, that's just icing on the cake. And I think this is what John would say. Our reward is there. Don't lose it. He says, don't lose what you work for. And then he says in verse 9, Now anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. All right. The teaching he's talking about here, of course, is that Jesus uh, you know, didn't come in the flesh. He says, if, if you don't, if you don't remain in the teaching that Christ did come in the flesh, you don't have God either. The phrase, the phrase here, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in this teaching. Have you ever seen someone that has a dog and the dog's sort of a house dog and you take them out on a walk and you have to put a leash on them and when you do that, do you have to drag the dog along and say, come on, come on boy, come on, come on. What does that dog do? He's running this way and he's running this way and he's pulling you and pulling you because he's running ahead. Now I never had a dog like that because the dog stayed outside and if I tried to put a leash on him I'd probably get bitten. But uh, you, you know the image here. A dog naturally wants to run ahead and this is John's image. He says, don't get ahead of yourself. Don't run ahead of the teaching of the basic teachings of Christ that says He came as a man. 
He was born in the flesh. And then he says, verse 10, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. Now this seems very harsh, but he says, if you participate in showing hospitality to help these traveling preachers, traveling church members, traveling false teachers along, you're sharing in their evil work. Don't do it. You can be cordial, but if you enable them, you're participating in this evil. And that's a word here we need to remember, an enabler. Well, I don't teach it. No, but you help promote it by giving them room and board for the night. This is serious. This was their culture. That's the way they stayed as they traveled. And John says, don't do that. Now, some people uh, take this way out of, out of line and say, if somebody disagrees with me and doesn't follow what I think is right, Man, I, John tells me not to have anything to do with him. No, he's not saying that. He's talking about this one particular serious objection to the life of Christ, and that is that he did not come in the flesh. That's what he's talking about here. Yes, the idea is the same, that we're not to participate in evil. But let's be reasonable here. This is the teaching that John is talking about. So we think, well, aren't we fortunate that this teaching is not prevalent today at least in our culture we have other problems we have other problems that people think about Jesus or whatever but at least we don't have this one this one was a bad one and, and thankfully we don't have it here with us today And uh, but yet the principle is the same always you know scripture scripture is eternal and it's universal I mean, it, it, it applies to every problem we have, but it's not specific. See, I don't read in the Bible anything about what to do about uh, taking, taking marijuana or drugs. So if the Bible doesn't mention it, well, no problem. Is that right? No. The principles of, of health and decency are there, and that can apply to all the problems of society that will come up now and in the future. And that's that's just common sense, okay? That's common sense. All right, any comment there as we get near our bell here a few more minutes? Anything there? Don't take in a, a traveling uh, false teacher? All right, John says. And finally, verse 12. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. You know, if we had the choice between writing a letter to a loved one or visiting with them personally, which would we take? There's no question we would take the visit, right? That's life. That's humanity. And that's exactly what John said. I'd like to come talk to you. Oh, I want to come talk to you. But I can't quite make it yet, so I'll write with pen and ink. Now, when it comes to our situation with COVID, we haven't been able to meet all the time this past year or so. We had to do it online and whatever. It's not the best. But for me, that's not a temptation to stay at home and not come to church when we can meet. Why? Because we want to meet face to face. We want, it's just natural. And we call it fellowship. We call it encouragement, right? We call it being together as people.